Greetings to all our learners. Welcome to CEC lecture. Dear learners, the topic of analysis is balance of power. In the lecture today, we shall try to address the concepts of the very important concept of balance of power theory in international relations. The very idea that how states secure their survival and also with this we shall look at the challenges in the traditional conception of balance of power theory. This lecture will be of immense use for the le learners from the discipline of political science, international relations, learners preparing for competitive examination and learners who want to have a key, who follow and have a keen insight on various developments in the world of global politics. In the lecture, we shall try to look at balance of power with reference to the bigger picture of world politics, looking at different typologies of balances from multipolarity to bipolarity and to the present global order, wherein today, because of new changes, because of new challenges, the idea of balance of power is facing ch new uh, challenges. At the outset, let's understand what do we mean by balance of power or how do we define balance of power. Balance of power is one of the oldest concepts of international relations. When we try to look at balance of power as a concept, it is used to analyze the problems of war and peace when we take the focus towards international history. Balance of power, as the academic literature tells us, has been seen as a universal law of political behavior. Balance of power, when we try to look at it in terms of policy, has been seen in the past as one of the basic principles of foreign policy. And most important, as we are looking at balance of power, that is, an oldest concept in IR used to analyze problems of war and peace, universal law of political behavior, one also has to then see that it is a part and parcel of the system of power politics. As the realm of power politics is witnessing changes, so is the concept of balance of power. Balance of power when we take the studies forward. Dear learners, what we are getting the insights here is that it is a device of international management of power. So, balance of power has been also perceived in the academic literature as a means, a method of power management. And this has been used by several major powers in maintaining a balance in their power relations. Then we all know that international relations is above all about positioning. Balance of power is also taken as a idea, a level of evaluative currency of relative power positions of states in, as actors in international relations. So as our learning is going forward, one idea that we are getting is that it is difficult to define balance of power in an exact way. And most important, it has been conceptualized, it has been defined differently by different academicians, different scholars. So therefore, there is a debate whether it's an equilibrium or one should perceive it as a principle of action or one should analyze it as a policy or a system. Let's now take some popular definitions of balance of power, which we take reference to popular online search also. Martin White uh, opines that balance of power is nearly fundamental law of politics and it is possible to find. Another definition that we get from Google search, Palmer and Perkins saying that power, balance of power 
you know it thrives on the principle and that is the principle that it is a basic principle of international relations another definition by ines claude junior that is the trouble with balance of power is not that it has no meaning and the idea that comes from this perspective by ines uh, claude is that balance of power has perhaps too many meanings related to uh, the idea that how balance of power has been defined differently by different scholars let's take the definition by sydney f fay balance of power as we quote from the definition is such a a just equilibrium in power among the members of the family of nations as will prevent any one of them from becoming sufficiently strong to enforce its will upon others another idea of balance of power as we are trying to decode various perspectives and theorization of the idea of balance of power comes from josh and brian brusher saying that balance of power is an equilibrium or a certain amount of stability in power relations that under favorable conditions is produced by an alliance of states or by devices dear learners as we are taking different definitions from different theorists scholars a very important idea on the concept of balance of power comes from hans morgenthau and as we quote the views of morgenthau we quote whether the term balance of power is used without qualification it refers to an actual state of affairs in which power is distributed amongst nation with approximately equality so what we see here is that when we try to re- read further from morgenthau's work morgenthau has used the term balance of power in different ways and this also speaks about what we are trying to address that as a concept balance of power has been theorized in multiple and diverse ways and as when we read the work of morgenthau balance of power as a policy is aimed as say a certain state of affairs balance of power may refer to actual state of affairs it may also refer to equal distribution of power or perhaps it may just talk about the vagaries of power once again quoting from hans morgenthau's work politics amongst nation the struggle for peace and power that is the balance of power is something what morgenthau says as perennial element in human history regardless of the contemporary conditions that the international system operates under another perspective as we are trying to understand the balance of power concept comes from the work of dickinson that is that there are two usages of the term balance of power and as we quote from dickinson's work that it means on one hand an equality as of two sides when an account is balanced on the other perspective and on the other hand an inequality when one has a balance to one's credit at the bank so what we see here is that as a status as a condition as we are looking at balance of power three broad ideas come forward that is it may imply equilibrium of power among states it may refer to distribution of power in which some states are stronger than the other and it may also refer to any distribution of power amongst the state another you know idea that how there there is a contestation with respect to the concept of balance of power 
comes from the work of uh, scholars and theoreticians like Haas. And what we see here is that one gets, you know, various types of mutually exclusive meanings. That is, balance of power may refer to equilibrium coming from equal distribution of power amongst nation states. It may result from, say, an equilibrium coming from unequal distribution of power amongst nation states. It may refer to equilibrium coming from dominance of one nation state. It may refer to a guide for policy maker. It may be perceived as a universal law of history. It may be seen as a concept to show mirror reflection of power politics. It may refer to a system providing for relative stability and peace and it may also talk about a system characterized by instability and war. So what we are seeing here is that when we are looking at balance of power, uh, various theoreticians, various uh, scholars have perceived it in different way. The nature of balance of power, when you see major features of balance of power, we take reference to some remarks presented by Palmer and Perkins. That is, balance of power may refer to an equilibrium, but which is subject to change. Then it may also talk about that it is how there is instability. It is temporary, unstable, only for say short time. Then one has to see that it, there is nothing like a miracle here. Balance of power has to be secured through state's effort. Then related to it is the idea that how balance of power at times may favor status quo. Balance of power system operates when there, uh, when there is like a present, uh, presence of say major number of powers, each of which determined to maintain a particular balance or equilibrium. And most important as we are reading through the various uh, uh, features of balance of power from temp, you know unstable, equilibrium subject to change, secured through state efforts, favoring status quo at times, one has to read the very important aspect that its aim, the aim of any endeavor by the state in global realms in the realm of international relations, it is national interest. So, what we see here is that uh, to add more to the explanation, we now take a reference to the ideas by Columbus and Wolfe talking about that what are the prerequisites, prerequisites of balance of power system. And here what we see here is that uh, they say that there must be multiplicity of sovereign political actors. There must be relative unequal distribution of power and then there must be control. Yet one, one has to see that there is existence of power struggle. Let us take reference to a very classical work and for that we refer to David Hume and the name of his work uh, is uh, that is essays and treatise on several subjects. As we try to go by his essays and treatise, one gets an example of Greek politics from his work that how it is an example of distinct expression to the notion of balance of power. That is how the Roman period saw a decline in the notion and operational aspects of balance of power as Rome virtually demonstrated monopolistic power over the world. Now, when we are trying to look at the historical trajectory, dear learners, let us now take some points of reference from the history of IR. When we look at the time period, say 1815 to 1914, academic literature perceives it as the golden age of balance of power. The periods between what we see 1648, that is the time of Peace of Westphalia, and 1789, the time of the French Revolution. What we see here is that this time period has been seen as a golden age of balance of power. With time as the world witnesses First World War, 
and paving way for the Second World War, the time framework between 1919 to 1939, as we go once again by analysis in academic literature, this has been seen as how there were attempts to unsuccessfully revive the balance of power. With the Second World War, 1939 to 1945, there were changes in global realms and the same was with reference to Cold War and post-Cold War era. That is, it implied that there were changes in IR. Now, with this changes in the theorization, in the practical perspectives and in everyday reality of global politics, of international relations, balance of power concept also face contestation. Now, as we are decoding balance of power, a very important work with this idea has been that of Kenneth Waltz and we quote from Kenneth Waltz two very important works that is Kenneth Waltz work of theory of international politics 1979 and Kenneth Waltz work of man the state and war a theoretical analysis 1959. Kenneth Waltz opines that how international system is considered to be anarchy. Now in this anarchy as we read from Waltz work is that the focus here is that there is no system wide authority being formally enforced on its agents. The states they monopolize the legitimist use of force. So dear learners as we read from Waltz work what we get here is balance of power then is an outcome a result or what we can say an outcome variable that reflects the causal effect. Now as we are reading through Waltz work two very important variables in Waltz work are Kenneth Waltz work are that of anarchy and secondly distribution of power in the international system. Now, what are the assumptions on which the concept of balance of power has worked? Firstly, we have to understand that in the realm of global politics, it is national interest which is supreme. The idea that one has to gain that is most important. So, therefore, the basic assumption of balance of power here is that states have interests and they want to secure their interests by all means. Then when states interact with each other in the realm of interaction, in the realm of interstate relations, interests of the states are threatened. They are always looked upon with respect to the other. Then one also has to see that based on factoring in national interest, based on securing your gains, the relative power positions of the states can be measured. So, therefore, an idea of the degree of accuracy exists. Then, power considerations are the driving factors for policy decisions by the respective nation states. Now, after these assumptions of balance of power, we now take the focus towards the methods. What are the methods that have been employed by respective nation states? to bandwagon with the bigger picture of balance of power. At the outset, as our learning has been telling us that balance of power is not automatic. It does not come on its own. It has to be factored in by the efforts of the state. It has to be secured by the states. So, an idea of methods would be compensation that is annexation or division of the territory of the state. Another idea of balance of power would be alliances, getting nations together with you. An example that, you know, international relations history is full of examples like Triple Alliance, Triple Anthem during the First World War, NATO, CETO, Warsaw Pact during the Cold War. So, therefore, the methods of balance of power as we are deliberating, we also have to see that how balance of power has to be secured by the state so, therefore, the method to secure balance of power would be contingent on their 
focus of national interest. Another important method of balance of power intervention and non intervention. Another method divide and rule. Another method armaments and disarmaments. Another method buffer states or zones. So therefore dear learners as we are looking at the various types of methods one has to see that there are examples from history to prove that how buffer zones, armaments, alliances, divide and rule have been employed by respective nation states at respective points of international and global history to factor in their national interest and secure their position in the bigger picture of global interactions. Then there are various types of balance of powers also. Let's have an understanding over that simple balance that we saw during the Cold War, bipolarism, wherein there are two states or two opposing camps. Multiple balance, whereas there is wide dispersal of power amongst the state. Then another typology of balance of power, local, regional and global balances. And last is flexible and rigid balance of power. What is essential to be factored in here is that the debate here is that with the end of the Cold War, dissolution of Soviet Union, rise of unipolarity, globalization and at the same time there are multiple new centers of power from BRICS, European Union, India, among Japan, amongst others. The bigger question here is then has it reduced the chances for the idea say of a hegemon or a balancer in international relations or somewhere does it you know pop, pose a big challenge to the idea of balance of power. When we are trying to analyze balance of power with respect to the contemporary challenge to this concept let's now look at both the sides that is arguments in favor and arguments against it. Balance of power has been seen as a source of stability in international relations. It is being, you know, which is always said that it depicts the real nature of international relations that is power dynamics. And then somewhere it talks, you know, the very concept ensures that there is multiplicity of nations, there is active participation in the carving out of the bigger picture of preserving the balance. Then there is a critical perspective to that also. We now take the views of Richard Cupton who criticizes that the balance of power is unreal, inadequate and uncertain. Then how somehow balance of power, you know, it is taking the focus of IR theory towards power hungry domain. Then how it fails to take into account that today when we look at the dynamics of nations, they are not static units. Today we cannot have afford to have a narrow view of IR power relations. One cannot have a mechanistic view of world peace because the state exists with non-state actors. The idea of national interest is multidimensional and how today there are various realms of power. So therefore, the big picture that one sees here is that when we are living in a world of significant changes, when global governance is also witnessing rapid changes in the world conditions. Then is balance of power in the realm of industry 4.0, rise of data and technology as new power currency, developments in international organizations and laws, growing interdependence of nations, rise of new nations, the entire process of decolonization during the Cold War and after the Second World War poses a big question that whether the earlier concept of balance of power, whether it is relevant today or no. In the post-Cold War world, there is a numerical reduction of great uh, powers and this is also has an important bearing on the dynamics of balance of power. So what we see here is today when we are living in, in a world where there is no world power now, change character of modern warfare, globalization with ties come cutting across natural boundaries, emerging importance of collective security, uh, international law and international organizations like United Nations. Amidst all this, there is a big question mark on the balance of power concept. 
an important work that has been there by Professor Richard Little that is the balance of power in international relations, metaphor, myth and models. And as we take reference to this work to problematize to the challenges on the balance of power concept, we have to see that how Professor Richard Little analyzes balance of power as a metaphor, as a myth and as a model. So what we see here is that amidst this, we have to see that how the changing context of global relations and this how this framework is used to reassess, re-understand some of the important major texts on balance of power, from Hans Morgenthau's Politics Amongst Nations, to Hedlebull's The Anarchical Society, to John uh, Mearsheimer's The Tragedy of Great Power Politics. The work definitely gives us new insights into interpretation of balance of power. So, dear learners, as we are, you know, taking the perspective of balance of power, a very important idea that we take reference uh, from the work of T.V. Paul, James Waits, Michael Fortman, edited work that is Balance of Power, Theory in Practice in the 21st Century, Stanford University Press, 2004. How it tells us that since the 16th century, balance of power politics has profoundly impacted IR. Now, with the end of the Cold War, with the rise of unipolarity and United Nations, uh, United States, there is a growing prominence of international institutions. But then one has to empirically assess its validity both at global and regional levels. That is, when we look at worlds, the diverse worldscape that is from Eastern Europe, East Asia, Latin America, amongst others, how today there are challenges posed by subnational actors. So, dear learners, balance of power, which is a central concept in the theory and practice of international relations, no doubt it holds huge significance as a power management device, as a device to focus, to get the right focus in foreign policy, as the idea to get the right understanding of power game of international relations. But at the same time, one cannot ignore that today there are various challenges to it owing to the changing context of international relations. We hope you all gained some significant insights from the lecture on balance of power. We look forward to positive feedback from you all for the lecture. Thank you very much for being with us for the lecture.